Welcome everybody to the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, Tuesday, November 9th. I call it to order and there are no alternates to appoint this evening. Um, but I will have roll call starting on the left. Sean Peterson. John Meyer. Carlotta Stardens. Bye, Shilly. Brian Gray. Mary Ann Chinati. Katie. So we're starting with public hearing. Z-2021-2104 of RMD Land Development, LLC, requesting special permit for elderly housing project, 52 one-bedroom units on property located on Tarbox Road, Plainfield, Map 10, Block 14A, Lot 47, RA60 Zoning District. And do we have someone speaking for the development?
We were asked to add street addresses for all the letters. So in street sheet one, it's upside down. Excuse me. Sheet one for all the letters. It calls out the last name of the property owner and the street address. So it's easy to orient who lives where. Um, that was one of the things that was requested. Um, we were asked what the hours of operation would be during construction. And what they're proposing is Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 3.30, Saturday, 7 a.m. to noon. The commission can change that if they feel that that's not appropriate, but that's, that's our first proposal. Um, at the meeting, concerns were raised about traffic impacts from the project. As a result, we, um, we hired a traffic engineer, Sean Kelly, from the NES Associates. He's here tonight to, give, to tell you what he found when he did a traffic, took a look at the traffic from the site. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, good evening, I'm Madam Chair, members of the Commission. My name is Sean Kelly, I'm a traffic engineer with NASA Associates. On behalf of the project team, I want to thank the board and the members of the audience for having us here tonight. Um, as Ellen pointed out, we were retained um, by the developer to uh, take a look at the anticipated traffic impacts associated with this project in terms of the number of trips that would be generated both on a daily and a peak hour basis, and then how that traffic volume would be compares to the existing traffic flows that are likely um, to be accommodated in the traffic uh, flow of the project. Uh, as pointed out, you know, the project entails the construction of 13 separate uh, residential buildings. Each one would have uh, four residential units. Each unit would be a one-bedroom unit, and they would all be age-restricted. Uh, in terms of identifying the traffic impacts of the project, we rely on data that's published by what's known as the Institute of Transportation Engineers. It's the, the federal database. Essentially what it is is it's a, it's a database of uh, uh, empirical data collected at, at various land-use codes throughout the United States, and they have data for everything from office space to residential developments to shopping centers, commercial projects. Uh, for this particular project, the most applicable data is what's known as Land Use Code 252, which is uh, senior housing, uh, age-restricted housing. Um, and what the data shows is that you know, when you get age-restricted housing, uh, typically you see a lot less traffic generated than, than typical uh, standard apartment units. And the reasons are twofold. First, um, as people are older, you know, typically they you have people are working less, they may not work in traditional hours, they may work less hours, or they don't go in from typical you know, 9 to 5. And secondly, these units are typically smaller. Uh, as pointed out, all of these units are one bedroom units. We don't just have any children, won't any trips associated with school traffic, school buses, things of that nature. Uh, what the ITE data, ITE data says is that for a project of this type, 52 units, typically on a weekday daily you have 192 trips. Um, that would be 96 trips in. 96 trips out. Uh, in terms of your peak hour traffic, typically in the morning you have about 10 trips during the busiest hour, evening 14 trips during the busiest hour. Uh, the question always comes up, you know, how can 52 units only have 10 trips? Uh, and it's important to point out that this is just one hour. So for instance, if the, the busiest hour of the quarter out there was 8 to 9 in the morning, you know, that certainly is when you can see those 10 trips. That, that's not to say you won't see other trips between the hours of 7 and 8, or even between the hours of 6 and 7, depending on what someone may work, or even 9 to 10 or outside those hours, but during the busy commuter hours, those are the trips you're looking at, about 10 in the morning and about uh, 14 in the evening. So it's basically you know, one trip every six minutes in the morning, and then one trip every uh, so about two, about four minutes in the evening. Uh, we understand that you know, this, this development could be a, a much more dense development. It certainly isn't you know, developed up to the maximum. You know, so we understand that there are 35 acres, and about 32 of them are developable. Uh, and the town bylaw allows up to five residential bedrooms per acre. So if this development were built out to its, to its fullest you know, maximum density, you'd be looking at about 160 units versus the 52 that are currently proposed, which would be about 592 trips, and then you know, 32 to 42 trips during the peak hours. So in comparison to what's allowed by right, uh, this project is actually about 400 trips lower than what could be developed, and then during the peak hours, anywhere from 22 to 28 trips lower. Uh, but again, it's important to point out that what's being proposed is, again, it's about a trip every, you know, uh, four to six minutes during the busiest hours of roadway traffic. 
Um, we expect the bulk of the traffic will, will come out and, and make their way eastbound towards Route 12. That seems to be the most convenient route to get to, to Interstate 395. Um, we took a look at what the volumes are out there on Route 12, approximate to the site. Um, quite frankly, there it's about 7,000 vehicles per day, and then during peak hours, it ranges anywhere from you know 350 to 400 per hour up to 600 per hour during the busier evening peak. So, you know, we're going to be adding you know 10 to 14 trips to a corridor that carries you know anywhere from 400 to 600. So, quite frankly, the increase is what we would consider a you know, daily fluctuation. You go out there on any given day, the volume is going to vary by that much. So, it's not a it's not a notable increase in traffic, and certainly not something that the average motorist on you know heading up to on a commuter route. And I think that's, that's really you know, the gist of our study. Again, it's, this is all based on you know, federal uh, guidelines in terms of the trip generation. These are the standards that's required by the Connecticut Department of Transportation. And you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're still looking at a very modest uh, increase, mainly because of the fact that these are all one bedroom units and they are age restricted. Uh, that's all I really have tonight. We have to answer any questions that members of the commission or audience may have. Thank you.
the I just want to put up a figure or pass out a figure for the commission to see. Yep.
come back to you as proof that we've met the concerns for threatened and endangered species, uh, we feel that that would be a very reasonable way to proceed. Um, again, as a, our previous presenters have indicated, I'd be happy to answer any questions for the Commission. And I think as is typical during these public hearings, we'd like to reserve the right to answer any questions, rebut any other information that comes into the record at the end of the public hearing. Thank you. Uh, maybe I didn't hear, yes. but what is the time frame for the condition from DEP coming back? From coming back from DEP? Yes. I wish I could predict how fast things will come back from DEP. Based on our past experience, for example, the uh, site in Waterford, one to two months from now, um, the turnaround is not crazy rapid, but it's not, you know, extended beyond a month or two. Um, the study, I would just point out that the place and the timeline where we are is that the herpetologist has completed the study and is writing up the findings, and within the next week, it'll be submitted to DEP. Once that submittal is made, a month or two should do it. Thank you. Thank you. This is a public hearing, so if there's anyone in the audience with a comment or question regarding this application, if you could please step up to the microphone with your name and your comment. So if there's anyone in the audience with a comment or question on this application. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Paul Sweet, 260 New Road, uh, Plainfield, Connecticut. I, I, when I first read this proposal in the legal notices, uh, as you know, when I was in government, uh, there were different things that came along that people wanted to do out there, and none of them ever made a whole lot of sense in financing and the question about who would be doing the proposing and things like that. When I saw this proposal, what was actually being proposed, I, I felt like, wow, that's if these people are reputable, this is, this is going to be a good thing because, simply put, our generation is getting older and uh, we, we, we need housing. We, I can think of four units in, in our, four projects in our town, but uh, be it as it may, this getting older thing is not a joke. Uh, people, people now are having trouble with, the, with their limits on how they can walk and climb in the traditional mill housing and apartments that we come to know. And uh, to be perfectly candid with you, uh, you know, when you're younger, things work well. But I will tell you all, and I'm in my other side of 60 now, the late side of 60, that the body starts doing strange things. And you're not as strong as you once were. And this is going to be a handicapped facility for, for 52 units. Um, I can remember when Parkway was there, I actually saw a Snow White with seven dwarfs there when I was a kid. And uh, the Beatles hold on, uh, not hold on, hot days work, at night, whatever it was. And, uh, and I had great memories when it was, a, when it was Parkway Theater. But now, this, this uh, proposal for, um, for the elderly and uh, the one bedroom thing, uh, so all I can say is go up to Westview Village on Broad Street. Uh, maybe it's too late for that, but I had an opportunity to go to a dedication here a couple weeks ago. And what a wonderful facility. And I couldn't help it. It's the first time I've seen that plan. It's almost the same idea as that Westview <coughs> Village. And we, we had this dedication and all the folks come out and uh, they were so happy that community they lived in and uh, you know they all became friends and things like that. So, you know, I would put this on my property, but you wouldn't know it to put it on my property, okay? So the fact of the matter is um, that the folks have a right to bring a proposal before you. And if they met all your obligations, and we all know from uh, my time in the town that uh, we spent thousands of, hundreds of thousands of dollars for frogs and salamanders and crazy things like this, and, and I have nothing against these animals, though, but we studied plants, mosquitoes, we studied everything. We spent a lot of money to put, we had Walmart on the hook, but it ended up being a Lowe's, and, uh, and all around that whole area, there's been so many studies done because of gravel operations that are going on. I haven't seen anything in great volume when it comes to frogs or salamanders or any of those types of things. Uh, I just haven't witnessed it. So. Uh, I just want you to know that, you know, when your Wall Street landfill was open, you had
had hundreds of trips over those roads uh, when that landfill was open. This is nothing. This, this, is, this is not even comparable to what it was when that landfill was open. Uh, I'm, I want to speak as specific to the need of that generation. And this would be a feather in the town of Plainfield's cap to do this and, and approve this project. I have no interest as far as financial or anything in this project at all, but I believe in it because our generation is getting older and, we, and we're going to need quality housing, affordable type housing for our senior people. Uh, it's an ideal project and I hope you all would consider that uh, because it's a need. It's a need for uh, our people and obviously you will get folks from outside of town, but you know, I, I don't know what the preferences are, but I can tell you this much, there are waiting lists in all the four projects I mentioned, okay? So, I, 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 the minute I read it, I was for it, and I stand for it tonight, and I hope you guys will uh, consider it. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the public on this application or questions? Any comments, questions, or comments? <coughs> Um, I have a question of the first people that are presenting. <clears throat> What's the zoning for this project? What was the zoning? So was this it? is an RA60 zoning district, and elderly housing is um, permittable under special permit process, which is the process they're going through right now. Um, another question, is this being uh, funded by any government funds for the elderly? <clears throat> Because it was a survey in the town of Plainfield two summers ago about what kind of housing what we needed in Plainfield. Uh, and I do know that <clears throat> there are other towns around that are getting funding. Uh, the people that are building the projects are getting funded for, I mean, they're getting paid money from the state and the federal government for building elderly housing. Now, we definitely need elderly housing in the town of Plainfield. But I don't feel that this is an ideal, high-end development for our elderly. Would you live there? I mean, if I would you live there? I would. Okay. Most people. Not a question and answer. So thank I you. Know. Most <laughs> most people. <laughs> thank you. Direct your comment here. The that you're talking about have respiratory problems, and that's breathing problems. Uh, <clears throat> so you have a wood burning plant that is. So we, we have to keep the comments related to the application before us. So if there's issues with other developments around, then those issues have to be filed with the zoning office. Those people living there will be sitting outside on the deck, and they will be breathing in um, whatever is coming out of the wood burning plant. They will be breathing in emissions from trucks, the train, uh, there is a welding company about 500 feet down the road from there. And <clears throat> I don't think you realize that Spalding Realty is selling three lots on the corner of Route 12 on the main road going into uh, Lowe's. And they are, they are commercial. So when you were talking about transportation figures, they will be skewed by the kind of development that are put in on those three. So once again, we have to base the application on the circumstances as they are now, not what possible future may be in its surroundings, because none of us have that crystal ball. So while I understand your concern, we really have to deal with the application in front of us and the circumstances as they are. So uh, while I appreciate your concern for future, absolutely. So if and when those other developments come along, that would be the time to address those other developments. I'm just making you aware of that because things will change around this development. Leaves fall off of trees. So you might be putting six feet high uh, fences or 12 feet high. They are still going to see in that direction north of it, they're going to see the stacks from the wood burning. If you've ever driven by there at night, it's quite an entertainment and kind of scary to see them with, with, with what's coming out of them. Plus, you have all the lighting in that area, too. <coughs> um, you've got to remember vibrations, the rumbling of the train and the trucks that are going through. Uh, I, I cannot 
There are other places in the town of Plainfield that would be much better for elderly housing. We need elderly housing, but this is not the place to put it. Thank you. Okay, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first one, it, Paul brought it up, was handicap. Are all the units <coughs> handicapped? Could you address if all the units are handicap accessible? <coughs> um, if you're familiar with the site, it is dead flat. Every one of these units is Right now, they'll probably be built up front with one step, just put water and everything, but it would easily be great if you couldn't even have that accessible. Because the whole side is flat, it's flat, we're making it one percent all the way around on the road, and gently and down, just to get water to flow. It's a perfect site for senior housing because of it, there is no, there are no speech slopes, there's no five percent, it's one percent every day. Thank you. I asked us cross cross creek down here. Thank they you. have some that have stairs, so it's one. And the other question was, are any of these units going to be considered affordable housing? That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. No, they're not going to be affordable. Okay. Be whatever the market is for um, rentals in the market. Any other comments or questions from the audience? Um, June Gagney. <clears throat> I just want to say that you have to eat this microphone because we can't hear you back there. So I just want you to know. All right, okay. thank you. Any other comments or questions from <coughs> audience members? <coughs> comments or questions from board members? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion on the public hearing. I have a motion from Ross to close the public hearing. Second by Sean. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Public hearing is closed. Moving on to item B, Z 2021-2172, Town of Plainfield Planning and Zoning Commission requesting a text amendment to section 19.3.8 of zoning regulations pertaining to lighting. So a few months back, and please use the microphone if you can't project to the back of the room. I will try to project. Thank you. Everybody here? Yes. Okay. So a few months back, <coughs> the commission came to realize that there were some deficiencies in our regulations pertaining to site lighting, and so we have uh, presented a text amendment to address those deficiencies. So for lighting, um, the existing text is to be striked, or to be struck, and post text is to read slight lighting. Any exterior lighting shall be arranged and designed so that the lighting will not adversely affect any nearby properties or the public roadway. All lighting shall utilize full cutoff fixtures. Maximum height of lighting fixtures shall be 20 feet. The lighting plan with a lighting diagram accurate to one tenth of a foot candle shall be provided with the site plan review application. The plan shall detail, detail the types of lighting, lighting fixtures, and show projection areas. And then, by request of the first selectman, uh, looking down the road at possible town development for um, athletic facilities and whatnot. Also included athletic recreational lighting, which is allowed or which would be allowed by special permit. The purpose of this regulation is to allow for adequate lighting of sports fields and recreational facilities. <coughs> lighting shall be designed in a manner that will minimize impact to dark skies and adjacent properties. Lighting fixtures shall be specifically mounted and aimed so that their beams will fall within the primary plane or recreational area and within the lighting specifications for safe play for planned athletic events. So typically an engineer would actually design um, athletic facilities with lighting to, uh, to meet specific standards for the, uh, the sports. Direct illumination shall be confined to within the property lines of the recreational use. Full light cutoff fixtures shall be required. 
The illumination plan shall be submitted, which demonstrates the property lighting, uh, property lighting installation. The design plan shall include the lighting requirements for each competition area, if applicable. And the specifications for te and technical measures showing how those requirements will be achieved. Special tree planting and or buffering to assist in light control and protection of adjacent properties and roadways may be required by the commission. The lighting plan shall be prepared by a lighting professional and contain the following. One, a photometric diagram showing the predicated, uh, sorry, predicted maintained lighting levels for the proposed playing field or fourth and associated perimeter and area lighting. Two, height. Light pole height is measured from grade or surface on which the light pole is mounted to the bottom of the lighting fixture. There are maximum height restrictions, but light pole heights must be shown on a illumination plan. Hours of operation. The commission may set hours of operation that are reasonable for, for the use in the surrounding area. It is advised that the commission set a time for the light to be turned off by 10.30 p.m. unless an event is still in progress. With the lights being turned off once the event has concluded. Lights that are automatic should be set to turn off at a time specified by the commission, which is advised to be no later than 10.30 p.m. And those are suggestions the commission would not be bound by that. So this is a public hearing. If there's anyone in the audience with a comment or question regarding the lighting regulation, please step up to the microphone. <coughs> Unless you can project to the room. Yes. <laughs> Polly O.J. Stoney, Hill Road, Musso. I'm just wondering if I can hear that well. Does this affect a residential? Or is this encompassing every kind of property in the town of Thank you. So I can address that. Okay. So this would be for um, anything that comes before the commission for site and interview, which is typically commercial, uh, but would also include what we saw tonight. Um, so anything that comes before the commission that has lighting would, would have to adhere by the standards as far as athletic facilities. Um, you know, typically athletic facilities are regulated by the town um, or owned by the town. So we don't, you know, I think we have one private athletic facility, which is Grand Street. So it's not, so not impact. a single family home. No. no this would no. not impact a single family home. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. This is for development. Development. Yeah. This is for developments, not single family homes. Okay. Primarily commercial, industrial. Or items by special permit that require a site plan review. Well, suppose we put in like a housing development and there was a single family home on the side of it. There's regulation so it doesn't impede on the single family resident. Correct. That's what the cutoff language is about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Hi, Gabby. Um, in the exist, existing text, it talks about no sky glow. Is that the same as down the bottom, impact to dark skies? And does that just go for the athletic fields? Or is that for projects like this also? We no require, sky glow? We require full cutoffs for uh, any commercial industrial. Okay, and that was my second question. What is the full cutoff fixture? Uh, a box like fixture, one where the the uh, bulb is not exposed, um, or does not drop down below the fixture. So it's directed out. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the audience on this application? Comments or questions from board members? The lights go out, you can't see the board. Just one thing, I know that, they, uh, that there is a misprint in here. So for number two, height. Light pole height is measured from grade or surface on which the light pole is mounted to the bottom of the lighting fixture. It's supposed, to be, it's supposed to say there are no maximum height restrictions. Because sometimes athletic lights have to be, you know, very foot high. All depends on the type of surface. So the commissioner would have discretion over, over the height. Madam Chair, one question if I could ask. Yeah. You need to introduce myself again. Paul Sweet, 260 New Road. Brian, does this lighting thing have, let's say you have the strip down by the dog or whatever, new business done. 
Would that be the place to walk the advertisement strip at a certain that time? Portion, that portion is only for athletic field lights, athletic recreation. So let's say, let's just say we want to put lights out here yeah. around the walking track. Yeah. They would have to come in for a special permit in order to do that. I just look at business in general, you know, sometimes. I just, I just want to know what it does to the advertising you know. So the time restriction is only related to the athletic fields. So the athletic field lighting would have to be shut off by a certain time. That's separate right. section than the oh, other. Oh, okay. That would be up to the commission for athletic fields. Right. Okay. Any other comments or questions from audience? Comments or questions from board members? Okay, so we're not hearing any additional comment. I'll entertain a motion on the public hearing. Motion. motion by John, second by Roz to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, public hearing is closed. Moving on to public hearing item C. Z 2021-2197, Howard Haggett requesting a special permit for excavation of 83,000 cubic yards of material to create two ponds and a single family home for property located at zero Lovers Lane, Assessors Map 8, Block 53A, 139A. And we have someone speaking for the applicant.
stockpiled on the sides or on the perimeter of the pond uh, where it could drain back in uh, toward the ponds. And uh, after the, the material has dried sufficiently, it could be removed from the site. Uh, the, uh, they are proposing hours of operation weekdays, Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 5 p.m. No weekends, uh, no weekends, no holidays. And uh, if, um, if, if this were to continue for just one continuous year, um, uh, it, it could be accomplished in a single year. In a single year. However, uh, Mr. Haggett actually isn't in uh, the state for about six months out of the year. So typically uh, uh, November to April or May or so, there really wouldn't be much activity there. Now, one caveat to that and, um, uh, is, is that currently Mr. Haggins is negotiating with O&G Industries to possibly do the excavation for him and, uh, and uh, take ownership of the material that comes out of here. Uh, in that case, you know, the, the, the proposal as we have it before you right now will utilize Lover's Lane to access and egress the site, approximately 15 truckloads per day. Uh, about 30 trips, you know, trip, uh, one trip out, one trip in uh, would be per truckload. Uh, that would come out to, to for, the, for the working day, about three, about three trips per hour. If uh, Mr. Haggett is successful in negotiating with ONG Industries, and, uh, and this is something that they're very serious about, uh, there'd be no traffic on Lover's Lane at all uh, because the, the um, uh, property would be accessed uh, through the, uh, the OG industry's property. Uh, the water elevation here, uh, the final elevation of the pond uh, that we're calling for uh, was based upon monitoring uh, that we did throughout the site. We had a total of four monitoring wells. Um, what we did note is that it's a relatively flat water table uh, with a slight, um, a, a, a slight incline that goes east to west. So there, there's a little bit of movement from, from east to west on the site uh, based upon uh, the, the elevation that we took. Uh, I, I would also note that the, um, the, the uh, groundwater elevations that were taken were very consistent. Um, and the only time we saw any um, attributable increase to those was when we had a uh, significant rain event. I believe we had you know, back to back uh, three to four hour rainfalls uh, over the course of a couple of days. And, and the groundwater elevation rose significantly at that time, but then it dropped back down again to, uh, to you know, the uh, elevations that are proposed at the pond. Uh, we found also that the, the measurements that we're taking uh, in uh, the monitoring wells really coincide with the existing pond on site. Uh, the, 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 the elevation of that existing pond uh, in the uh, northern part of the site that was partially on the ONG Industries property uh, and, and partially on Mr. Haggis' property uh, do correspond uh, with the uh, groundwater elevations that were, um, that were measured uh, in the monitoring wells. We, do, um, we, we did uh, uh, address uh, the uh, comments of uh, CHA uh, we did uh, visit the site with them, and they, they took a look around and uh, walked the site with us. Uh, there, weren't a, there weren't a whole lot of um, comments they had on this. This is a relatively simple operation um, with regard to um, gravel or material removal. Uh, one of the things uh, that they wanted to see uh, with regard to the proposed single-family home uh, is they wanted to see a rain garden uh, to collect the roof water so that they wouldn't discharge directly to the existing pond on site. Uh, we did add that to the plans. Uh, one of the other things, uh, they talked about uh, showing groundwater contours to show the direction of groundwater flow. You really have a, a difference of elevation from one side of the site to the other of, of probably three or four inches. So to actually show contours really isn't possible unless we're showing them incremental. Point one. So uh, uh, that was explained uh, to CHA Engineering. They agreed that uh, based upon the monitoring wells and the measurements that we took, it just doesn't seem relevant to produce groundwater contours. Uh, 
uh, says the plans must specify the drain from the excavated stockpile materials and the drain from the interior of the site, the newly excavated ponds. Uh, we have noted that on, uh, on uh, the sheets. It was actually noted on uh, sheet number two. Toward the bottom when we showed the stockpiles. Uh, we noted that uh, position stockpiles of excavated materials to drain back toward the excavated area. Uh, and it's going to be typical for both ponds. Uh, this is a very flat site, and fortunately, we are, uh, we're able to uh, you know, make that happen uh, based upon uh, the, uh, the current elevation of the site. Um, the location of the anti tracking pad must be provided in the site plans. That's shown on sheet number one, the overall uh, plan. There is uh, an anti-tracking pad there currently. Um, it will be it will be maintained. Uh, that would be right there at the uh, at the um, start of the driveway. Um, one other thing, general general note uh, one on sheet two appears to conflict with the construction fueling area labeled on sheet two. Based on this, it appears that fuel may be stored on site. Uh, the design engineer must clarify this. Uh, we did not say it's fuel to be stored on site. We do show a dedicated fueling area where vehicles uh, and excavation, excavated material um, uh, equipment would be going would go to this particular portion of the site uh, to be fueled. But there will be no bulk storage of fuel on the site. Um, lastly, uh, the cost estimate for the stabilization of the site has been provided, uh, and we did um, we did provide that as well. And uh, I believe it was acceptable. So um, that's really um, kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, this is not a long-term operation. It's not a one-and-done. Ponds will be excavated, ponds will be completed, and uh, and, uh, and the, the residents will be built there. And uh, uh, that will be the end of it. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you can have. Okay, thank you. This is a public hearing, so if you have a comment or question on the application, if you could step up to the microphone, state your name and your comment or question. My name is Henry Castaldi. I live on Lovers Lane. I want to know what happened with all of the contaminated soil that was on that site when it was a junkyard. Was there any? Because I was a junkyard for 35 years. And in 2010, Dave Jarvis and Jane Hokanen set a fire down there. And DEP went down there and they found numbers of oil tanks cut open and dumped in the ground. And all that material left there, but where did it go? Plus, we have wells on that site. So in the area of disturbance, is there any environmental issues? Yes, it was noted. Well, we are not aware of, of any out there. I know that um, Mr. Haggett has been cleaning the site. Uh, there were some areas where there were, he did find car parts, he did find tires, um, and uh, he had those stockpiled and removed from the site. Um, Based upon the, the uh, movement of, of material that has occurred on site to this point, uh, we are not aware of, of any areas. I was out there actually when we done the test holes for the health department. Um, I know, you know, definitively there's nothing in those particular areas where the septic system is going to go. And um, obviously, if, if something like that is encountered during the excavation process, then it needs to be handled accordingly. Accordance with uh, the state parameters uh, and uh, the, the requirements uh, for hazardous waste disposal. Um, like I said, um, based upon the, the amount of excavation, and we went out disputing the fact that it was a junkyard. Absolutely was. Um, I think you know some of the old aerial photographs show that um, has been substantially cleaned up uh, to this point. And um, all I can say is going forward, we haven't extensively dug holes out there and done. Um, any kind of uh, groundwork monitoring or anything of that nature. Uh, but um, based upon the fact that people have operated wells out there and, uh, and there's, no, there's no current contamination with the wells, uh, we don't anticipate there this being an issue uh, going forward. Once again, Henry Castaldi, who is on Channel 3 News about the contaminated soil. Joanna Gonzalez from the state of Connecticut was down there. DEP was down there. Not only that, but what about the toads and the frogs in that area as well? 
there are any environmental studies in this area currently? No, there are any environmental studies. It's it's surrounded by 400 acres of, of an excavation um, a project uh, right around there. This this has all been previously disturbed. Um, if anything, the only potential habitat that might exist here would be that existing pond on the site, which is, and we are staying more than 100 feet away from that with, with the proposed house. We're going to leave a, 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 a continuous uh, buffered uh, tree line around the pond, so there's no activity in that direction. Now, the rest of the site is it's currently uh, much of the topsoil has been scraped off there and is stockpiled on the site. Um, it's been exposed uh, down to the, the subsoil and gravel layers, uh, as you can see on the surface at this point. So, uh, the areas, like I can say definitively where those ponds are, it's, it's bare ground. So, to, to you know, think that there might be any kind of uh, habitat there uh, for any kind of uh, endangered or protected species. And the natural diversity database does not indicate that there are any species of concern uh, in this particular site. Thank you. Question? The direction of our water flow, did you say it was east to west? Correct. So it's falling on to the northern east. Yes, very, very slightly. Like I said, we have we have maybe from, from one end of the site to the other, a three to four inch gradient in that direction. It's very, very slight. It's a relatively flat water table. This is a public hearing. Any other comments or questions from audience members? Yep, I'm right back. What about our, our aquifer? That's right underneath that property. They're going to be digging into it. So the maximum depth on the plan is 150 feet. Is that correct? Well, yes. The maximum the depth of the pond is 116 feet in its elevation. Okay. So the actual depth of the pond is how deep? 16 to 20 feet. 16 to 20 feet. 16 to 20 feet. There's people on Mother's uh, Lane. The elevations are 137 feet from where they're going to be digging. Their wells are 150 foot deep. What happens when they get in the aquifer and drain everybody's wells dry? Are they going to put new wells in? Your wells 140. Right. The water's there now. Uh, right now you've got right now you've got water. We we you know, we have very definitive proof of where the water table is there. So if you're going to be removing the gravel uh, in the area where the water table is, the voids are just going to be full. <coughs> we're, not, we're not excavating deep down. If, you, if you've got a 130 foot well or a 150 foot well, we are well over 100 feet above that. And With 13,000 gallons of water. Please don't yell. Thank you. It's, it's water that once the pond's filled, it's there. Nothing's going to be drawn upon those ponds. Um, there, there are the ponds on on the uh, adjacent properties. There's a pond, uh, a portion of it on, on this property as well. Um, like I said, once once this once this pond is full, it's full. The, the water level is going to stay where it is. Uh, we don't anticipate any impact whatsoever on on adjoining wells because if the wells are drawing from a deeper from a point deeper than what our pond actually is, up to 100 feet deeper according uh, to the testimony given here, then there's really not an opportunity for this pond to impact water that's 100 feet below it. And what is the depth of the existing pond? It's, it's only about 8 to 10 feet, only 8 to 10 feet. Okay. So the existing is 8 to 10, the proposed will be 16 to 20. Correct. Any other comments or questions from audience members? And if you could just state your name for the record. Sure. Richard Cody, 105 Public Lane. My concern is with the gravel. 82,000 yards, cubic yards of gravel. That breaks down to about 4,150 trucks. And that's a lot of traffic if you're going down a residential road. Especially heavy trucks, because even at 20 even at 20 yards in a truck, that puts you right at the weight limit for Connecticut. The road's very now. I, if, if he can if he can uh, arrange with O and G transportation out that way, that makes a big difference. But right now, Lovers Lane's not wide enough for that kind of traffic. And when he's saying 15 loads a day, I've been in construction for 40 years. It's not going to be 15 trucks a day running out of here. 
I do it every day.